Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Um, so, I, we've made quite a few videos at this point, uh, and the one video I've kind of been holding off making is a video about uh, the do's and don'ts and the equipment that I use and uh, why I use the equipment that I do and what kind of equipment somebody who's just getting started in this should should be using. Maybe some tips and tricks and and showing you some things you shouldn't do and you should do and and things like that. So I wanted to get into this video with you um, and just give you a quick rundown um, of all the gear that I use uh, and all the different parts and why I use those. Um, so we're going to get that started right after the intro. Hope you guys enjoy it. So the very first thing that I want to talk about is screwdrivers um, and and different tools to remove screws and different swords. So you guys will see me use quite a bit uh, this particular screwdriver on my channel. This is just a powered small and they're eighth inch screwdriver. Um, this thing is powered, charges via USB, very, very, very handy. However, um, there's a lot of times that that is not the best tool to use, and I go to my standard, um, I, I don't know what else you'd call it other than your technician screwdriver. Um, you can purchase a set like this. This is a brand called Wonice on Amazon. It's got the extendable, uh, extendable lead on the front of it, swivable, swivable end on it, and it comes in a nice little kit all packaged up like this um, and some of these some of these extra pieces I've just kind of thrown in as I've got uh, gathered them over time it comes with little suction cups and little sim removal tools and stuff like that it's a great little toolkit uh, for about 15 20 bucks um, and it's gonna have every size of screw along with your tri wings for your Nintendo's or your security torques for your uh, for, for your Xbox or whatever, just multiple different sizes. It is absolutely a kit I recommend. I, I actually strongly recommend this particular brand. Um, I really, really, really like the small form factor. It tucks in the corner and all the screws or all the bits that come with it. However, I also highly recommend this set with the electronic screwdriver or the digital screwdriver I was just telling you about. It's all motorized. Um, it comes in this little gizmo this little gizmo set here um, and the screwdriver just kind of pops into the end of it for storage obviously you know listen once you take it out you're never going to put it back in you're just going to charge it and leave it however one of the things that I love so much about this particular kit is it comes with your standard Phillips uh, and flats uh, and a couple of hex bits that are extra long and those can be real handy uh, when dealing with a uh, a, a, a Nintendo or some of the other game consoles where the screws are deep. Uh, it comes with a lot of the security bits that you're going to need. Not all of them. The good thing about this, again, is it's the 8th inch drive, which is the same as this guy. So the bits for this will work in this and vice versa. Um, so if you're looking for a good screwdriver kit to get, I highly recommend this. I don't remember the name, but you can find them uh, on Amazon uh, for really cheap. And I say really cheap. This whole set's about thirty dollars, give or take. So not too bad. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is toothbrushes. Uh, and I say this all the time on my channel, guys. Get lots of toothbrushes. Now you can go out and you can buy your Colgate, your Oral B's, or whatever you want, or you can go on Amazon and you can buy a bulk pack of these toothbrushes for $15 and it will come with a hundred toothbrushes or more depending on which one you get you are going to use these a lot you are going to throw them away uh, because once you get flux in them they get stiff and they no longer bristle properly and all you're doing is smearing the flux on the board buy these uh, another good thing you can do with them once you're done using them or they're all gunked up you can you can throw them in a, a sink full of soapy water and scrub on something 
um, and it'll knock most of that off. Now, and I've got several sitting over there that I use for cleaning consoles with, and they're great for cleaning cases. They're great for cleaning boards. They're great for cleaning small parts. Uh, and again, they're so cheap, you can just throw them away when you're when you're done using them. Keep you a whole lot of those around. Very handy. Um, moving on from there, we're going to step up and talk about multimeters. So this is my standard go-to bench multimeter. Uh, this is a Fluke 87V. This is a whole lot of money for a multimeter. Um, I do not necessarily recommend that anyone buys this particular meter. Um, it's fantastic in every way, and it does absolutely everything. It will do temperature measurements. It'll do capacitors, diodes, you name it, it'll check. It'll check AC, DC, amperage, voltage, capacitance, the whole nine yards. This is a great meter. It's true RMS. They don't get much better than this. These are the gold standard when it comes to multimeters, period. Uh, the tilt tilting bail on the back allows you to prop it up and set it where you're most comfortable. It's got a nice, uh, really nice loud beep on it. which is really handy when you're doing continuity tests. It's got a nice battery life on it. The battery lasts genuinely forever. Um, and I say forever, nothing lasts forever, but the battery lasts a good long time uh, and is very easy to change out. Um, the test leads, I do not use the Fluke test leads, not because they're bad at all, um, but because they're not fine enough pointed for a lot of the electronics work that I do. but. Any set of standard plug-in test leads will work. Um, this out of the box 87V will come with all sorts of attachments depending on which ones you get. Uh, it will come with absolutely all sorts of stuff that will allow you to test temperatures or clamps or alligator clips, things like that. Great multimeter, but you don't have to spend that money. Um, my other go-to is a Fluke 117. Um, this multimeter, I, again, I use have used this for years. I love this multimeter. It is not quite as full featured or as capable as the 87V. However, uh, for most of your electronic works that you're going to do, this will get the job done. Uh, and it will get it done very, very, very well. It also has auto volt on it that will detect AC and DC for you. Um, so that's all you have to do. The price difference between these, this is a this is a hundred dollar meter. This is a three hundred dollar meter. Which one works best for you just kind of depends on you know what your budget is or or how how specific you want to get. The range on this uh, on the 117, it doesn't go as far down into uh, the 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 thousandths of positions that this one does. But in the grand scheme of things, you really don't need that. Um, you really, really, really don't 100% of the time. You don't need as much precision as 87V. The 117 is absolutely, I use this for years and still use it. If you notice, I keep it clipped to the bottom of my bench. I'll pull it out occasionally in some of my videos and use it um, just because it's smaller. I can get it up here where I, where I want it and versus the size on this one, it's just so much larger. Um, so multimeter, you don't have to get a fluke. It's the gold standard. Uh, Ampro makes some great ones, and there's some other ones uh, that are that are highly recommended. I am, like I said, a, a, a huge advocate of using a fluke. Um, I've been using them for years as an electrician by trade. I cannot recommend them enough. Um, but you don't have to. You just want something that's going to be a good quality meter and give you a good, reliable, uh, a good, reliable number. Um, so. Go with something like that. You won't. You won't regret it. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about are tweezers. You're going to want an assortment of tweezers, uh, and the ones that you'll see me use the most are going to be just the standard fine point tweezers, and you'll also see me use these broad point tweezers. Okay, these have a much broader tip, and they're great for grabbing a hold of screws. Um, they're great for grabbing a hold of other components. They're not as fine detail work, but they are very handy. When I pulled these out, I thought I probably won't use those much, but I'll give them a shot. 
I ended up loving these. They are my go-to 90% of the time. Um, the other gold standard is a good set of angled, like this, okay? Um, they're very good. You can buy these for cheap. The brand that I use and that I'm using right now is from Xcool or Xool or I'm not sure what it is, to be honest with you. Hmm. Anyway, you can get these on Amazon. They'll come in a little... Uh, and a little package like this, and it's got all sorts of assortments in here. Again, 12 15 bucks for this assortment. It's a great little kit. Um, you'll pull out the tweezers that you want to use, and you will keep them on your bench, and the rest of them you'll roll back up. And the good thing is they, they include multiple in there, so you know, you'll have plenty of those. Um, one other set of tweezers, though, that I, I recommend highly are a set like this, okay? These are auto close and when I say auto close you have to squeeze them to open them okay and these can be very handy for chip removal uh, or for small components because you're not having to sit there and try to hold something forever you're if you're trying to place a component it's a lot easier to maneuver that guy in place because you're not having to squeeze to hold it you can get your precision pretty good the only thing that I'll say is Depending on the brand that you get, the squeeze on them is not always the best. Um, and not all of these tips are created equally. These are ceramic tips on the end of these, so they will not heat up. They won't burn, uh, but they will shatter and they will break. So you can't push and pry on them and pry things apart like you can with the others because these will just snap off on you. The tips are replaceable, and you can get more tips for them. I... I love these things. I don't use them a whole lot, but when I do, it is the most handy tool in the world. Um, so get you a good set of these. These are going to be a little bit more expensive than your standard electronics or uh, technicians or jewelers or whichever you want to call it. They're going to be slightly more expensive. They're probably $20 a set if I remember, maybe $25, but they're worth every penny. Um, as you get into working on consoles you're going to buy a lot of little boxes and uh, parts and things and they're going to come with these little pry bars and they're going to come with spudgers don't throw them away keep them keep everyone you can get your hands on you will throw them away once they're damaged but they're a great tool to have um next thing i want to talk about is a fiberglass scratch pen so these things work real simple uh, like a mechanical pencil you twist it and it screws in and out um, some guys swear by these. They're a couple of bucks uh, on Amazon or AliExpress. They are great for cleaning solder mask off a board. You can get right down there and just scratch away an area. I This has a use um, and I keep one uh, on my cart beside where I work. Um, it's got its use. I don't, I'm I recommend having one, though I don't use mine very much. Um, but it's a great tool to have. They come in different abrasions, so you can buy a kit, you know, uh, with different grit levels on it, different abrasion levels on it. I've not found any that whatever abrasion level this one is, and however the five six bucks I paid for it does the job for me. But I don't use it a whole lot. Uh, as it wears out, you can again run it in or out, which is kind of handy. Um, moving from there, brushes. Um, no, this brush did not come from my wife's makeup. You, you can you can buy a, an assortment of different brushes. Um, you want something with a very stiff bristle, very stiff, and you want something with a very soft bristle. This is for getting dust particles out of CD drives or cleaning just the tiniest little bit of thing without leaving dust behind. This is a very great tool to have. You won't use this a whole lot, but when you do, uh, it will make it will be all the difference in the world. So you want to definitely get you an assortment. You can buy them in a kit again, Amazon, eBay, AliExpress, something like that, um, and it'll come in a pouch full of different brushes and uh, you know of different bristle heights and shapes and things like that. Most of them you won't use. This one I use quite a bit, and this one I use a whole, whole, whole lot. So definitely get you some of those. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is flush cutters. 
These are Hacko flush cutters. I've tried different brands. I have a couple of different ones over there. Uh, here is where I'm at in my life and uh, in my life at this particular point. I keep a set I'm using and I keep another set in the drawer, uh, brand new in the package. And when these wear out and stop cutting good, I throw them away and order a brand new set, pull those out of the bag and, and, and start using them. A good pair of flush cutters really will make your life better in so many ways. Um, you can buy these for cheap. And when I say cheap, you can get the knockoff brands, you can get the cheap brands for a couple of bucks. Um, you can get a Hacko set is a little bit more expensive. They're twelve, thirteen dollars, uh, but they are worth every penny, uh, and you should definitely get a set. Uh, if you don't have a set, definitely get a set of flush cutters. Don't use a set of diagonal cutters. Uh, as like electricians use, don't use those. Don't use a pair of set of wire snippers. Uh, don't use a pair of scissors. Get you a pair of flush cutters. The way they cut is completely different, and will give you a much better, cleaner result on your work than than you're going to get with anything else. So get a set of those for sure. The next thing I want to talk about is just, and I don't even know what brand. I don't even know where I got these from. Uh, they're Craftsman apparently. But they are a real small pair of jewelers. I think I think the wife bought me these as a as a Christmas present. I think um, their their jewelers are micro uh, micro pliers, whatever. They're not quite. I mean, they are needle nose, but they're not quite. They've got a little cutting area. These will be very handy for you. Uh, you want something that you can get a hold of things with sometimes stronger than what you can do with a pair of tweezers. Anything will work. It doesn't have to be anything special. This is not a precision tool at all. It's just a tool. Uh, but they're very handy, so you definitely want to get a set of those. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is a set of helping hands. Uh, and I recommend a set of helping hands. I'm not going to zoom my camera around yet. I'll do a pan around shot in a little bit. But a set of helping hands with a magnifying glass, preferably a lighted magnifying glass. I use this more than I use my microscope. I use this more than I than I do absolutely just about anything else uh, because it allows me to get in tight uh, and look at something that I just can't get a good view on any other way. Um, and I can hold it right where I want it, take a good look at it, and then I can push it up out of the way and it gives me an extra light source too. And that is very handy. So you definitely get you a set of helping hands. If you're not sure, I don't know if these will reach all the way over here on the screen. Yeah, those will reach. So helping hands uh, are just these little guys right here, and they've got little pliers. You can get the little cheap set, the little the little metal base with like two little hands on it for ten bucks, or you can buy a nice set that's got a, a multitude of them uh, on there that you can adjust and pull out for you know twenty thirty bucks. Again. Spend the money, get the nicer set. Um, I they're never for me. They're never weighted enough. They don't have enough weight in the in the base to do anything. I keep mine screwed to the table, oddly enough, um, just far enough where I can get my micro, my uh, magnifying glass out and take a look, and then I can put it back up for for that. Um, very handy. Speaking of that, and I think I broke this out the other day on one of the other ones. I recommend one of these. This is a, um, a hobbyist soldering holder, and it's slide adjustable, so you can adjust it to whatever board size you want that you're working on. These pins, uh, these little jaws right here, will collapse and hold pressure in on your board. And once you have it in there, you can twist the whole thing around and get it right where you want. I don't see many people using these, however. Um, what I discovered is they will absolutely, let's see, well, let me slide this in here, I'll show you what I mean. A little bit of tension on him, and you can rotate that whole board around, it holds your board in place, you can get right in there, work on whatever you want, pulling components in and out, no problem whatsoever. This little guy, again, these these little holders, they're they're not the cheapest thing uh, in the world. They're twenty five, thirty bucks, but they are worth every penny. You won't use it every day, 
But when you do use it, there is nothing better on the market for doing work. I use these when I'm doing a, um, uh, a Sega Game Gear. I use these almost religiously because I can prop the entire board up there, rotate, spin, do whatever I need to do with it. And it, it not only does it raise the, the, the board up off the table so I'm not bent over as much, but it gives me that flexibility of moving the board right where I want it uh, and making my life a little bit easier to see, a little bit easier to work on. So definitely get you a set of these guys. Can't be beat. Moving on from there. Moving on from there. Um, the next thing that I'm going to recommend, we'll talk about are desoldering tools. So you'll have a desoldering tool that looks like this. This is just a standard hand pump or a bulb. Some of them look like a bulb uh, that you might use to suction a baby's nose out with. Um, I recommend these. They, they're several different brands. This is Koto. These, this is a little bit more expensive than the cheap plastic ones. Um, let me move this camera down. You guys get a little bit better view of what I'm, what we're working with here. This is a Koto brand. Um, they, it's a replaceable silicone tip on the end of it. They are simply no other words a a complete game changer. If you are used to using the plastic and 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 not very good solder suckers that that are just cheap and they're aluminum and they're just you know the cheap ones those little hard plastic tip on them this will be an absolute game changer for you uh in the in in the amount of freedom you have with the tool um and the ability of it to do its job will it will absolutely it is money well spent now having said that they are a little pricey you can get the cheap solder suckers the little plastic cheap ones you guys know the ones i'm talking about for five bucks. This is going to cost you $30. This is going to cost you another five bucks because you're going to, you're going to replace the little silicon tips on them fairly frequently. Um, so three, I believe it's three millimeter silicone tube. Um, I just buy, I buy a buy, I think, I think I bought a yard of it or three foot of it or a meter, uh, cause everything's, everything's in metric these days. Um, I think I bought a meter of it for five bucks and I just snip off what I need uh, and use it but this right here this is a fantastic tool can't be beat for removing solder uh, on a budget okay on a budget and I'm going to explain why I say on a budget here in a minute um, the next thing we're going to talk about is solder wick okay now this just happens to be MG chemicals no clean super wick um, and I'm going to kind of compare and contrast that against this Chinese brand. Um, I don't even know what you'd call this. It says desolder. It says solder wick on it, but it just isn't. Um, and I don't know how else to say it other than it, it just it just isn't. Um, I'm going to get in and show you some of this stuff a little bit more in depth about what I mean when I say it just isn't. We'll look at this under a microscope versus this, and I will show you the ability of the two to wick away solder uh, in a little bit uh, later on. We're just going to run through, do a brief run through of tools and stuff like that for now. If this comes with your soldering station, if this comes in a pack of stuff, hey, listen, by all means, you know what I mean? Use, use what you got. If this comes with it, use it. But if you're buying something to use, save yourself a lot of headache and, and buy Super Wick. Goot Wick is another one, spelled G-O-O-T, is another great one. I'm a huge MG Chemicals fan. Um, use, use, I use this. I love this. Some guys love Goot Wick. Six one, half dozen the other, same, same. Absolutely a fantastic product. Make sure you keep plenty of that around. That is a great tool. Moving on from there. Uh, while we're talking about MG Chemicals, uh, let's go ahead and talk about MG Chemicals. Um, the flux that I use uh, is MG Chemicals 836 liquid flux, no clean. Okay, that's model 836 LF for liquid flux, NC for no clean. Uh, lead free, halogen free, great resin. It's rosin free, so the smell that you get's not nearly as bad. It's not listen. Soldering is bad for you, okay? Let's let's all be honest. 
together. Soldering is bad for you. The, the fumes getting into your lungs are bad for you. This does not have as many of the bad chemicals in it as some of the other. It's still bad for you. I, I still don't recommend breathing it in, but this is much better for you. It's also no clean. Now, the truth is you should still clean this, okay? You still should. You should clean this with isopropyl or the next thing I'm going to show you. Um, this is a great product. You should absolutely check this out if, you have, if you've never done it. This comes in a liter bottle, just like this right here, for about $20, $25, give or take. Um, great product. I keep that. And then what I do with it is I put it in one of these small bottles. Now, these little small plastic, this is a 30 mil bottle. Um, you can get a whole bag full of these of various sizes and various tips, again, on Amazon or eBay for, you know, five, ten bucks. I instead of having to sit here and pour all of this out and make a mess everywhere I use these little bottles fill up what I need I can put a drop anywhere I want just one drop at a time or I can do a whole line absolutely great product make sure you get some of these bottles it'll save you it'll save you in the amount of flux or or isopropyl alcohol or whatever liquid chemical you're using these will save you a fortune um, so absolutely check check out MG Chemicals Liquid Flux and make sure you get those little bottles. A funnel, a small funnel. Um, one about that size right there, okay? One about that size right there. Get him, keep him under your desk or keep him somewhere close. Um, and it just help you fill the bottles up a little bit easier. Little pro tip right there. I have fought over a sink filling, uh, filling my little bottles up and you always spill some little funnel keep you keep you in good shape the next thing the next chemical we're going to talk about is MG chemicals 4140A flux remover when you're working on a board I don't care whether you're removing or putting components on whether it's a new build or you're repairing a console sooner or later you're gonna have to use flux okay and when you use flux I don't care if it's no clean I don't care if it's chip quick. I don't care what you use. I don't care if it's MG Chemicals, no clean, flux paste. There is a residue left over. For a nice clean board, use some flux remover. Um, now, I will give you a tip. This is not a pour on and scrub right off. Put it on there. Give it a few seconds. You know, give it 10, 15 seconds. Let it work. Let it break down those chemicals. Uh, and it will, with a toothbrush, scrub whatever that flux is right off. Um, again, this this chemical, it's flammable, and it says it right on the back. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for your lungs. You don't want to breathe this in. This is one of those chemicals you put on, okay, with your extraction fan running, all right? You let it sit. Most of it's going to evaporate off. You scrub it, and it'll come good and clean. Always, though, follow that up. Follow that up with your isopropyl alcohol, okay? Um, where to start with isopropyl alcohol? It doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't matter what brand you get. This is Vaxin Labs isopropyl. Here's what matters. This says 99%. Do not waste your money at CVS or Walmart or Walgreens or Amazon or anybody anywhere else with the small little liter bottles of 93% or 91% for $15 20 tops you can get a gallon jug of 99% isopropyl alcohol it will last you absolutely forever uh, it is cheaper in the long run and 99% will do a better job of cleaning things up uh, Absolutely keep isopropyl around. You're going to use that quite a bit. Um, so kind of on my bench, the, the three mini bottles that I've got handy, I've got my flux, okay, my liquid flux MG chemicals. I've got my slightly larger bottle. Okay, This is my flux remover because it, I will generally put more flux remover down than I do flux. Okay, And then I've got, so I'm going to bring him back over here. I've got my big bottle of isopropyl because I'm going to go through a lot more isopropyl 
that I do anything else. Um, one little thing about these bottles. When you take the caps off, first off, these plastic caps are going to crack and break. Again, buy a bag full of them. You'll be fine. They're going to break. Um, just replace them. These tips are going to leak sometimes. Hey, it happens. Again, just replace them. They're cheap. They, they're, the, the bag that these come in, because it comes in a little plastic bag, it'll come with 20, 30 tips in it. It'll come with 15 bottles. You know, use what you need. Um, so as far as chemicals, that's all uh, on those chemicals. Let's talk about flux, though, or uh, let's talk about flux a little bit. So I showed you our no clean liquid flux, right? Talked about him. We also have Chip Quick, okay? This is a good flux. We also have our no clean flux paste, right? We're going to put him over here. We're going to talk about this guy in just one second. And then we have, and you guys have heard me talk about it before, um, and it's always John the Jerk, right? Okay? We've got John the Jerk's tub of flux, okay? And he kind of twists open, and it just kind of looks like, and it's nasty, and it's rosin, and it smells horrible, and it's terrible for your lungs. It never fails. Every time that I use this, I end up sick as a dog. I really, really, really do. Um, this is SRA soldering products. It's made in the USA. This is not a bad product. Um, however, how do you get it out of this onto the board where you're working? Well, you, you, the only way that you can do it is to heat it up or to take your Q-tip, right, and you rub it around or a toothbrush or whatever, and then you smear it on the board. It's just a problem. Let me explain what this is actually for, okay? So as you're soldering, you get your component or whatever it is that you're trying to to tin the tip of. It's, it's generally for wire. and I, I don't have any wire handy just yet. But you would take your wire and you'd, you'll dip him in, okay? Soften him up a little bit. And then you'll apply your... And as you apply heat, it'll start... Flux is basically an acid, okay? And it'll start eating, eating away and give the solder itself something to adhere to. Um, and that's, that's what this is used for. Other than that, the only other practical use that a, that a tub, tubo flux like this will have, is for tinning your tip uh, of your soldering iron. We will talk about that and how to properly tin your tips in a little bit. So buy a little tub of this and then put it in your drawer and forget that you have it. Okay? Now... Flux-wise, we've talked about our no, no clean liquid. We're going to talk about our no clean flux paste and our chip quick. These are two different brands. Uh, this is MG Chemicals. This is just made by Chip Quick. Uh, this is a tacky flux, okay? And tack, the difference between a tacky flux and a non-tacky flux is that this stuff is going to stay where you put it. It is not going to budge. And when you're done, your board is going to be as tacky and sticky as it can get. Again, using our little jar of flux remover, right? We go ahead and clean him off. This is pretty expensive. Chip Quick is not cheap. Um, however, Chip Quick, this little tube right here, if I remember, is about $15, $20 for a small tube. I only use him for removing chips, for removing... Whether whether it's a whether it's a processor, whether it's a, a DSP, whether whatever it is, whether it's a memory module, whatever, that's all I use him for. I put it down, and you're going to have to apply it, heat the area up. You don't. You, this is not something you use your soldering iron on. Okay, this is something you use your hot air rework station on. Okay, and you're going to heat it up, and it's going to burn off, and you're going to apply some more, and and it's great because it stays in place. And it will work its way into things almost better than anything else. Chip Quick is a life changer. It really is. However, it is expensive and it is tacky. This is MG Chemicals uh, No Clean Flux Paste. This is basically a paste version of what's in this jar. Now, I keep this over there because there are times when I need it. But I really don't use this much. Um, it comes with all the little fittings in it. Keep this around. It's great for certain things, but again, um, 
I, I, I stick to my liquid 99% of the time, okay? Um, so definitely, definitely, definitely have some of that around. Flux paste is great. Um, keep him around handy for you. This is another thing by Chip Quick, okay? And what this guy right here is, sorry about that, I had to take some medicine, um, is inside of this, this is a, basically a Chip Quick Flux with solder melted inside of it is why it's such a silvery color. Um, and so you'll see on my YouTube channel and other guys' YouTube channels where they're working on an area and after they wick away all the all the pad, they're gonna they'll want to apply solder balls or something else. The idea behind this is that it fluxes the area, and you can also, as you are applying your solder, okay, you're not having to sit here with your solder working a whole area, okay, at all. You simply apply this, and it fluxes and applies solder at the same time. You won't use this a lot, but it's another one of those things that is an absolute game changer for you. Uh, so I re highly recommend getting it. It's a great thing. The last tube of stuff we're going to talk about on my desk is Arctic MX4 Thermal Compound. Um, this is not the best thermal compound in the world, but maybe it is. Okay. Um, and let me explain why. So this tube right here, let me dig in my little, my little magic drawer over here, uh, my little drawer of stuff. Just one second. Where did I put it? Ah, here we go. This tube of Arctic MX4 Thermal Compound is about $15, okay? It's a huge tube. I don't remember. It's 20 grams of thermal compound. I don't remember how many milliliters or whatever. This is Thermal Grizzly's Cryonaut. Okay. Now, without a doubt, um, per watt meter Kelvin, okay, which is the way this is measured, Cryonaut is by far the best. However, this little jar right here, this little syringe right here, was also $15. Let me see if I can get him out and give you a size reference of $15. So this is our Cryonaut. This is our Arctic MX4. Now, according to, according to all the information I can get, um, Cryonaut thermal paste is good to about uh, 11.5 to 12 uh, watts per meter Kelvin. MX4 is 9 to 10. What's the difference? Maybe 5 degrees Celsius, if that. On a, and we're talking about on a, on a, on a very high-end PC. On a console, nothing. No difference whatsoever. Uh, as a point of reference, I recently switched over my laptop uh, from MX4 to Thermal Grizzly because I tend to run my, my laptop pretty hard when I'm when I'm editing videos and I wanted every little last bit I could get. On a four hour run, uh, running shotcut, editing the uh, Jaguar video, and I say a four hour run, it took four hours to, to export one portion of the video, 100% uh, CPU load, and it's a Core i5-10500U I think anyway. Um, average temps on MX4 were 82C. Average temps on Cryonaut were 81C. It's cooler. But why would I use anything but this? MX4 is kind of the gold standard. Get you a big tube of it. I will tell you this. These, uh, these twist caps, they just get stuck on there. I don't know why, but they do. Um, get you a pair of pliers and twist them off. That's all I can tell you on that. Um, moving on from there. Scalpels, knives, picks, prods. You guys will see me in my video. I'm a huge fan 
um, of my my pocket knife, and you'll see some guys will use scalpels uh, and some guys, different things. Also, guys, as a scraping, picking, prying, cutting tool, it's all what you like. Um, I just happen to, this is a Kershaw, I, I don't remember the exact one, uh, I think it's a Niantic, I think, uh, but I just happen to like my pocket knife. Um, this is not my everyday carry, as a matter of fact, it stays on my bench 100% of the time, it never leaves here, uh, it just stays here, always right there, um, and half the time in the video, once I've opened it up, I toss it up there and leave the guy sitting up there uh, out of the way, uh, but... Whether you use a scalpel, whether you use a razor knife, whether you use an X-Acto knife, whether you use a pocket knife, whether you don't like any of those, okay, that's a personal preference type of a thing, all right? Whatever you feel most comfortable with, and I feel most comfortable with using my pocket knife, so that's what I use. Uh, I have a whole nice little set of, of, of scalpels and X-Acto knives. I don't use them. I use my pocket knife 100% of the time. If I've got to scrape a trace off, if I've got to clean something up, if I've got to cut a trace, um, if I've got to cut wire, if I've got to strip wire, um, I bought this set of wire strippers. Hora's um, D Professional Tools. I bought this set uh, because Voltar recommended it, and he said they're the. This is it. This is the gold standard. Buy these. This is the greatest thing in the world, and he recommended it, and so. I thought I'd give them a try. I'm an electrician by trade, and these are not wire strippers. They're just garbage. Okay. Uh, again, I'm an electrician by trade. I've traveled all over the country. I have terminated wire as big as 1,000 KC mil all the way down to 40 gauge. These are not wire strippers. They are just garbage. Um, I would not wish these on my worst enemy. I hate them. I've tried to use them. I've looked up. I've, I've actually looked up videos. Um, it's got an adjustable depth stop for for you know how far you want to strip the wire. Again, I have looked up videos on how to use these. On maybe I'm doing it wrong. I've tried to adjust them tighter or looser. They're just garbage. Um, you may love these. Voltar certainly seems to love these, and he is by far much better than I am. Um, but to me, that was a complete waste of $20. Um, for me, stripping wire, again, back to my pocket knife, is what I use. Um, but again, I've been stripping wire with a pocket knife for years. You know, I'm not saying that you should, I'm just saying that's what I use. And the most important thing to remember, and it doesn't matter any of these tools, any of the things that we've looked at or that we're going to look at today, the most important thing for you guys is what are you comfortable with, okay? What tool do you feel the most comfortable with? That's the tool you want to use, okay? Now, there are some tools that are just bad tools, and you need to adjust yourself for, but being comfortable with the tool that you have and the tool that you're used to using makes the difference between getting really good and having a great result or, be, or or never getting good and having terrible results. So find the tool that you're comfortable with and use that. This is what I use. Um, and this is what I recommend other people to use. I believe in these, in these things. Um, moving on from there, uh, we're going to talk about Kapton tape or polyamide tape. Okay? You can buy a pack. This is a Chinese brand. I don't know that I can't even pronounce it. Um, Kapton tape. Kapton tape is a high temp masking tape. Uh, it's electrically non-conductive and it's rated for high temperatures. Uh, if you are working on a circuit board and you see like a yellowish tape, that's what Kapton. That, that's Kapton tape. Okay. Uh, and they put it down for a number of reasons. First off, again, it's electrically non-conductive. It will absorb. It will take plenty of heat. Um, and when I say plenty of heat, you can just about put your soldering iron to it and it won't burn. Um, I don't know what the temperature rating of this is. It doesn't say anywhere, but I've not been able to burn it. It'll melt a little bit, but I haven't been able to burn it. Anyway, capped on tape. Definitely keep some of that around. You're going to need it. The next thing that I'm going to recommend to you, this is a... Oh, cool. 
It's the same brand as the people that make my, my little map, uh, which we should talk about, I guess. Um, Kasai, Kasai. Real ultra-thin double-sided tape. Okay? This stuff is very thin. It's double-sided. It can be a little bit of a pain to work with. However, um, buy you a pack of this. You can stick all sorts of things down. It'll help you guide wires without using uh, without using uh, a hot glue gun. It'll help you do all sorts of things. Um, the reason that I bought this actually is if you're working on a Wii U, those little squares you have to take off, and and then they never go back on. They never stay back on. You can cut, this is actually the perfect size, the small one. You can just cut the square off, stick it to the bottom, it's there, you're done. Great product, absolutely recommend. Um, moving on from there, let's talk about wire. Now, there are all kinds of different wires that you can buy uh, and all kinds of different gauges. This is just standard silicone wire. I believe this is a 24 gauge, I believe. 30 gauge. This is 30 gauge hookup wire uh, on eBay. Wire's wire. Okay. Now that's not true. Silicone is high temp. Okay. So it's not going to melt out of your way. Now there is also Kynar wire. Kynar wire is a uh, telephone wire, right? Well, it comes in Cat 6 or something like that. Um, and it's a really good wire. And it's solid core. And this is not. This is stranded. So stranded wire is a little bit more flexible. Uh, and it's also harder to shape. In other words, it does not want, it will hold its shape, but it doesn't want to quite like Kynar uh, wire or any other wire will. What it won't do, though, is it won't, the jacket won't melt away when you expose it to your soldering iron. And that's important. Um, the only thing I'll say about this is always tin your wire, pre tin your wire. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, anyway, at any rate, this wire, not super important. The gauge of the wire is important, okay? The gauge of the wire is important. I have 30 gauge. I've got all the way down to 36 gauge. We've got all the way up to 20 gauge. Um, just depends on what you're trying to do. Um, it, it'll come in a strand of, of multiple, or I say a strand. It'll come in a box full of multiple colors. Um, great to have around. Again, this is great to have. Also, again, Kynar wire. Um, which I can't find my box right now. I don't know where it went. Um, but it's a solid wire, okay? And it's great to have around. Now, moving on from there, and this is our little Chinese brand of, this is 34 all-wire gauge. This is wrapping wire, okay? Uh, and Or they call it wrapping wire, or they'll call it music wire, or they'll call it magnet wire. It's all the same thing, okay? Uh, what makes this difference? This is epoxy coated wire. Okay, uh, the melting temperature temperature rating is 155 C. So at 155 C, the the epoxy coating around this will begin to melt off. You will have to melt that with your soldering iron to get solder to stick to it. Um, this is very 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 fine wire. It comes in a spool that is 400 miles long. Um, you can get this in all different sizes and, and all different brands. I've got some in there that's from a Chinese company called Mechanics uh, or Me Mechanics or I'm not sure. I think it's Mechanics. At any rate, it was very expensive and it is very, very small. I believe the British call it not 0 .02 uh, or 0 .02 uh, millimeters. It is absolutely finer than your hair, small. Um, this is great for connecting traces and repairing things. Keep some of this around. Um, you won't use it a whole lot, but when you do, you'll be glad you have it. Try to match up the thickness of the trace that you are working with to the thickness of the wire. You can go bigger, but you don't want to go smaller. Now, try to remember, too, the trace is flattened out, okay? It's, it's flat whereas this is round. So get as close as you can to the width of the trace, but you don't have to be exact. Just don't go super small and you'll be okay. Now, moving on from there, I want to talk about solder. This is the cheapest 
garbage solder you can buy. Okay. Does solder make a difference? Yes. 100%. And we're going to get into that in a few minutes. We're going to show you, I'm going to show you the difference between the solders. Okay. And why you should go with one brand versus another. I'm going to show that to you. I want you to see it in person. I want you to see it on video with your own eyes. I want you to see it. Um, solder is critical to the job and the quality that you're going to get. You can get a roll like this. This is cheap. Um, and it's not very good. Let me show you what I recommend. Let me pull my little soldering cart out. Okay. Also, by the way, get you a solder cart, solder holder cart. They are fantastic. Um, what I recommend is Kester solder. Okay. Now this is leaded solder. All right. Um, why would you want leaded solder? The standard is not to use leaded solder anymore. However, leaded solder melts at a lower temperature. Mixing it with non-leaded solder is not advised. However, it will make removing of that solder much easier. Um, Kester is the gold standard. If you have never tried it, spend the money. Yes, it is expensive. Yes, you are going to look at it in your cart and you are going to go, oh my God, that is a lot of money for a roll of solder. However, it is worth every penny, every single penny. It will make your life better. It will make flowing those joints better. Uh, it'll make them look better. It'll make them last longer. Worth every single penny. Uh, and I will show you that uh, here in just a little bit once we get once we get into showing why we use certain things. Um, Again, get you get you a solder wire card. These things are fantastic. I don't know how I don't know how I ever lived with doing this number and you know fighting with. I don't know how I did that uh, for so long, but I did uh, until I got one of these guys. You just kind of prop him up and you pull off what you need. And when you're done, you you know roll him back in there um, or throw him off to the side, whatever. Great tool to have. Um, so don't don't use cheap solder. It'll save you it'll save you a lot of effort not to use the cheap solder. Uh, so don't use that. Now, let's move into the equipment that I actually use. Um, so let's start with um, let's start with my microscope. This is by Coolertron. Um, it is just a standard tilting screen microscope that you can get on Amazon. Okay. Um, and this is going to be a great time to show you our solder braid too. So. Um, it's adjustable for height, up or down, and adjustable for focus. It will take a memory card. It will record picture and video, which is fantastic and very helpful. Uh, and it will really, 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 really zoom way down in there, which is great. Uh, if you guys can see that on screen, we are nearly touching at this point. Nearly touching. Um... It doesn't draw a whole lot of power. It's got some great lights on it. Uh, it will auto adjust for lighting, which is very handy. It'll come with a couple of different microscope hoods. Now, this is not an expensive microscope. However, uh, while it's and when I say it's not an expensive microscope, I think I paid a hundred, one hundred twenty bucks for this guy. Um, it also comes with a little remote key and all that stuff. While it's not super expensive, and it is a little bit confining on the size of the base sometimes uh, as far as what what you can get up here uh, it, it's it's not the most expensive one in the world I have been thoroughly pleased with this can't recommend it enough and absolutely use this more than I ever thought I would um, so get you one of these while we're here though let's talk about for a second and while we've got our microscope out and try to focus a little bit now this is not an autofocus. You you you've got a little turn dial right here that you turn to dial in your focus amount. Okay. However, uh, with the screen again, it comes with the screen and the stand and all that. 
for the price, you can't beat it. So the first thing that we're going to do, uh, and I'm going to slide, we're going to use our cheap Chinese desoldering wick with no name brand whatsoever on it. We're going to slide it under here. And I'm going to let you look at this under the microscope. I'll tell you what, we're going to zoom, we're going to get way down here close. Okay. Okay. So, can you guys see that? Let me zoom in a little bit more for you guys. There we go. We'll get we'll get all the way down, fill up the whole screen. So, you guys can see that in the microscope. You see how coarse that is, and how loose the braid is. Uh, it just doesn't. That doesn't look bad. Okay. Just remember that that doesn't look bad. Now let's pull out our MG Chemicals Super Wick. You guys ready? Check this out. Now, that, see how tight everything is? See how much finer everything looks? See the braid on it is so much different? Let me zoom out. We're going to put these side by side. I'm going to keep our... I can zoom out where we can get them side by side on screen and focus this in. Okay, that's our MG Chemicals. And we're going to slide up our Chinese no name brand right up here beside it. There you go. There's your difference. So our, our, our MG Chemicals is on this side that I'm moving, wiggling, and our Chinese brand is on this side, okay? Can you see the difference, okay? Can you see the difference, the build, the build quality difference in it? Can you see how much tighter our MG Chemicals brand is? Um, can you see, can you see the, how much finer the strands are and how much tighter the weave is? That's the difference. Now, I'm gonna show you in practice as well what what the difference is but I wanted you to see on camera what the difference was okay and we'll I'll, straight up 100% fair comparison that's a great that's a great tool to show you that at any rate uh, you don't have to buy these they come in all different brands uh, and I say brands they come in all different shapes and sizes and costs and things like that you don't have to go all out and spend the same amount you can spend more if you want uh, but this is a great product that I love, and I cannot recommend it enough. Um, it's what I use, and, and, and to be honest, it's what you should use. So, moving on from there, and I'm going to see. I'm not, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this without, without taking the camera loose. So, but before we do that, okay, let's, let's do it this way. Soldering iron wise, um, I use this is a Yahiwa ESD safe uh, soldering iron. Um, this is the stand that comes with it, a little hacko holder, and all that stuff. Um, this is what I use. It's the Yahiwa 939D Plus Digital. Uh, it, it was a, it was an eighty dollars soldering iron, and I think they've gone down in price since then. Um, I am a huge fan of this soldering iron. Now, it's not the new T1 style, and it's not a hacko. However, for ease of changing tips, it doesn't get much easier. And yes, you can absolutely burn yourself. It's a soldering iron, hot and all that stuff. Um, however, I have never once had a problem with this thing getting up to temperature or holding temperature. And it doesn't matter what size soldering tip I use. Uh, and for reference, I do use a, a, a large 45 degree chisel tip for 99% of my work. Um, I, I use it, I love it, it's my favorite tip. While we're talking about tips, let's talk about a few more. Now you can buy the Hacko brands, uh, and Hacko makes some great soldering tips. This brand, um, New New Acolox, I'm not sure the I'm not, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Um, let me see. I I doubt if I put that up there, you guys will be able to see that either. But we'll we'll give her a shot. 
give her a shot. See if you guys can read that. Probably not, huh? New 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 Kalox. Um, anyway, these tips I have been stunned by how good they are. Uh, I have used a bunch of them, and I keep them up here in my little bin. I've got a 45. To, I've got a little 45J tip. I've got a smaller chisel. I've got a. I've got a blunt tip. I've got a. Um, I call it a smear tip. I don't. I don't know what else you'd call it. Uh, big broad rounded thing, and then I've got a smaller smear tip that I use. Um, I love those tips. The chisel tip that I've got on there now, I've had for probably two years, maybe a year and a half, two years. And it still works as good today as it always has. Um, can't recommend them enough. Um, the next thing that I'm going to tell you, uh, recommend to you, is the Yahiwa 948 uh, desoldering pump, desoldering gun. This is a life changer. As good as as good as this Koto desoldering hand pump is. This is even better. Um, comes with all kinds of different tips. As long as you keep it clean, it'll run forever. You absolutely can't beat it. Uh, and the next thing, and then we're going to talk about these a little bit more later. The next thing I'm going to recommend uh, is our Yahiwa. And this is, this is the 959D hot air rework station. Now, this thing is, I've, I've tried several different brands of hot air reworks. This was not expensive, but it absolutely gets the job done. It gets it done fast. It will hold temperature. It gets up to temp. It's got an auto cool. It's got several presets on it. You can preset the channel one, two, and three for whatever temperature you want to use. Uh, it's incredibly simple to work with. Very long lasting. Never gives me a lick of trouble. Great product. Uh, and again, we're going to talk about those a little bit more here in a few minutes. Uh, the wife has called and said it's dinner time, so let me go eat, and then we're going to come back, and we'll go through how some of this stuff actually works, and I'll show you my whole rig setup and table and all that stuff. Okay, guys, I wanted to take a second and show you my setup here for you guys to see. Uh, so just a basic, simple setup. Um, so this guy back in the corner right over here, that's my little monitor. It does HDMI and composite uh, and VGA as well. Um, Moving over, we've got my soldering irons, uh, and I've got my soldering iron here, my desoldering gun, and then I've got my hot air rework nozzle there. Uh, I've got an extraction fan here uh, with a ring light on it, which does help quite a bit. And these are the soldering irons that, that I prefer. This is my simple setup. Uh, the 939D+, the 948, and the 959D, um, as well as my meter. And then over here on this side, I've just got my random things, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's books of uh, capacitors and resistors or or uh, extra work table if I need that, um, and then multiple cartridges up there that I happen to be working on on my shelf and whatever random things that I need. Um, in the back over here, I've got a multi-port USB that gives me a voltage. I've got a kilowatt down below too, kind of keep helps me keep track of um, how much voltage that I'm pulling and things like that. Uh, and then my extra large work mat that I've got here uh, to do all my work on that you guys see. These guys too, um, and I've talked about them before on the channel, these are just silicone dish mats for your kitchen. Um, they are incredibly handy and I can get that dirty without getting my main mat dirty. Um, buy these, again, over here I've got a smaller one that I used for years uh, and I do really enjoy that one. However, this one is much larger and gives me a lot more room to work with. Um, beyond all that, I've just got my lights that I've got, and then my camera mount sits up top. Um, but that's that's my workstation. That's my layout. Uh, I keep everything right close at hand, uh, so so as I'm working, I can get right to it without having to move too far away. And that's what you want. You want you want your setup to be nice and close to you. Uh, when I turn all my gear on, um, again, the good thing that I like about the 939. Uh, D plus is the adjustable and again this thing will hold temperature like nobody's business again this one multiple channels you can pre-program dial your temperature in and out exactly where you want it in your flow um, really great hot air rework station I do have the nozzle attached to 
the uh, desoldering gun here. Um, but that's just because it's easier for me to reach over and get a hold of. Uh, and it's not so close to the wall uh, because I do, it is, it, it's probably about a foot from the back of that to the wall. It doesn't look like it on screen, but it's probably about a foot, give or take, there to the wall. So it gives the air plenty of room to dissipate before it heats up the wall too much. Uh, and that's that's my basic simple setup. Um, underneath, I'm not going to show you underneath my desk because it is absolutely filthy there. Uh, but I've, I've also got a drawer, uh, and I say a drawer. I've got several drawers um, over here full of components, whatever that I just happen to might need um, there. And then I've got even more over here in this shelf, uh, whatever components I might need there. Uh, but at any rate, that's my simple setup. Um, those are the tools that I use for the job uh, to kind of fit in with the video that we've already shown you uh, thus far. So the next step of this video is going to be showing you guys the differences in soldering and, and, and some techniques and some tips along with the differences in some of our solder braid that we talked about earlier, our little Chinese knockoff solder braid and our good solder, solder wick and uh, some of the other stuff. So let's get into all right, guys, so we've got everything set back up. Um, the first thing that I want to show you on this, and I've got the microscope out because I want to show you the difference, um, is our cheap solder versus our expensive Kester solder that we've got over here. And the very first thing we're going to do is instead of even using flux, um, we're just going to use no flux, straight up tip, and I'm just going to show you guys the difference in the quality and what it looks like with our cheap solder versus our good solder. Uh, so we're going to go straight to this very first pad. And heat him up. Okay. So that is what our cheap solder looks like. And I'm going to clean my tip off because I want a fair comparison. We're going to get our Kester solder from the other side. Okay. And we're going to go to the pad right beside him. And there is the difference. In the two solder joints. So again, taking our cheap solder, okay. This is our Kester coming in over here. I'm gonna set him off to the side. This is our cheap solder right here, cheap Chinese solder. Okay. See how it looks kind of dull, okay? Uh, and I'll get you a better view of that right here in just a second. And again, going back to our Kester solder, right beside him. Slide that over so you guys can see it, okay? You guys can see the difference, okay? So why does why why, why does it do that? impurities okay that's why this cheap solder right here this activity solder mutter mutter brand whatever cheap Chinese whatever I'm not saying it doesn't work okay I'm not saying it won't solder a joint I'm just saying that it has a lot of impurities in it and it won't hold the wire as well it won't hold the trace as well and it doesn't look as good okay it just doesn't um, and because it has so many impurities in it, the contact that it makes is also not going to be as good in the long run. Okay? And what you want is you want a solder joint that's going to last for a good long time. Okay? And, and when I say good long time, theoretically forever. Okay? You can pivot this guy around. Uh, I'm trying to do this in screen. Sorry. Let me move back over here where I can see. And you guys can see. You can pivot this around. And you can see the difference in the Kester solder. And again, this is no flux, no flux whatsoever. So I tell you what, let's be unfair to our Kester solder. Let's just be unfair. Let's make this completely unfair and uneven. Okay? We're going to go ahead and use flux. Use our little flux jar on our next pad over, 
Okay? And we're going to use our cheap solder. And we're going to see if flux will even make it better. So we fluxed it. Look at that. Look at that. No difference whatsoever. And that, again, is with flux. So I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll go one step further. We'll flux the next pad over, and we'll hit it with our Kester solder. Look at that. Look at the difference that you get with the Kester soldered versus the non-Kester solder with flux, no flux. It's just a much cleaner, prettier, crisper joint that will last longer. And I want to show you one more thing while we're here doing it. Okay? I want to show you one more thing. We're going to come all the way over here and get me some fresh pads. Okay? I want to show you how long it takes to make this pad. So you guys get ready and start counting. Okay? We're going to come to this pad right here. I'm going to put my, again, my soldering iron is at 395 degrees right now, okay? I'm going to put my soldering iron up here on this end, and I'm going to come in down here at the bottom, and I'm going to wait until the solder flows. See that? See how long that takes? Think about how much heat I had to put into that board to get it to do that. Okay? Now, we're going to come right beside it. No solder. Done. A fraction of the time. A fraction of the time, guys. And, again, this is why... I use the Kester solder. It's just a prettier, cleaner joint all the way around. Okay? You come down here to some of these vias. Done. Done. That fast. Just that fast. You take our, your cheap solder, okay? Take your cheap solder. Look at that. I did the same thing. And look at the quality of that solder joint right there. Okay. Let's apply a little bit more so we can get the, so we can get a, an even bead. Okay. There you go. Look at that. See how it just doesn't want to pull up properly? Look at our Kester solder that we put on. Look at that. Okay. And we come down here from our Kester to this one. I'm just going to have to keep applying. There we go. Now we finally got something. Now we finally got something. Look at the dirt. Look at the debris in it. Okay. Look at the impurities right here on this side. I didn't do anything different. And that is why we use much, much, much better solder. Okay, that's why that's why I recommend Kester. That's why I use it. That reason right there. Okay. Um, if this is not enough of a hay, look at that. I had no idea. Now I want you to remember this joint right here. This one. Let me get my tweezers out. This guy right here. Remember, this is the one. You see all this trash? This black these impurities in it right here this was with flux okay look at our caster beside it both sides look at how pretty and shiny those pads are okay that's good solder those are good joints here and here great joints both of our casters this not so much okay okay not so much this is not good this is not what you want these two or Kester joints. Those are what you want. Now, let's talk about wicking this away. Let's talk about getting rid of this. So we've got our Chinese no-name brand, okay? 
And this is how I do this. First off, I'm all these little there's little strands right here on the end. I'm going to make this as completely fair as I can. I'm going to strip that off. I'm going to cut me off just about that much. Okay? Now this is how I do this. You can do it whichever way you want. I'm going to fold him up at a little bit of an angle. Okay? Soldering iron still sitting at 395 degrees. Okay? I'm going to make this unfair. Okay? I'm going to make this unfair. I'm going to apply a lot of flux, a lot of flux to this area. We're going to take our braid. Tell you what, let me prop something underneath this because he's wanting to rock around. I want you guys, I want to be able to put some pressure on it and get it where you guys can see. Here we go. We're going to apply some more flux. Again, I'm making this unfair. You're going to see that in a second. We're just holding our iron down at this point. There we go. Now, do we see how long that, that took us to remove? Okay, and we still didn't get it all. If you'll come to, if we come down here to this pad, you can see on our fourth pad right here, we still didn't get it all. You can look up here on these guys and see. We still didn't get it all. Look at that. It's still there. Okay? I know you guys can't feel that, but on screen, my tweezers are getting hung up because some of that didn't get removed. Okay? So cheap Chinese solder. Oh. Now we're going to go with our, with our MG chemicals. I'm going to cut a bigger piece than I just used. Right? You would think... Well, is that really a disadvantage? Oh, absolutely it is. And let me explain why it's a big disadvantage. Because now I have to heat up even more wick than I, than I did with the other. Okay? Now, we're just going to... Let me get this up here so you guys can see it good in the, in the shot. Get it where I can put a little bit of weight on it, a little bit of pressure on it. Here we go. I'm not going to put a lot. I'm just going to put a drop. I didn't pour it down there. I didn't even put it on the board. I put it on the wick. You guys ready? Watch this. In mere seconds. In mere seconds. We got nearly all of it. In mere seconds. Okay? In mere seconds. What's the difference? We had a bigger piece. Okay? We applied with our smaller Chinese flux. We, we took, and I say Chinese, with our smaller cheap junky uh, solder braid, we had to apply a lot more flux. We had to apply a lot more heat, and it took a lot more time than with our MG chemicals. This is why we use our MG chemicals. This is why, right here. Because it's faster, it's cleaner, and the job it leaves behind is a better pad for us to work with. Well, yeah, but is it really a better pad? Well, let me show you. Again, we're going to take our... I'm not even going to reflux it. I'm not even going to go through the trouble of refluxing it, okay? I'm just going to take my soldering iron and I'm going to quickly wipe over these pads, pull them back up here, look at that, look at that. Now you can tell, you can tell the pads that had the not so good flux on it from that one right there that had all Kester solder. You can tell, okay, you can tell, right? So if you wanted to know why I say we use Kester solder, this is why. This right here, this, 
this is the exact reason why. Because we want as good of a job, we want as good of a quality as we can get. And even though it is a little bit more expensive, it is worth the money in the long run. I'm going to set this guy aside. And we're going to, I'm going to show you now how to tin, properly tin, your soldering iron tip. Okay? Now, there is initial tin. Okay? When you get a brand new soldering iron, like this one, this one I've never even used, okay? Or soldering iron tip. This guy I've never even used. He's brand new, literally brand new. This one that I've had on here for what seems like forever, um, we'll start with this guy. So when we go to every time you use your tip, okay, you'll see a couple of different, you'll see people recommend, you know, recommend using these brass wool is what I cut. It's like, it's like an SOS pad, but it's made out of brass in these little cups, okay? And the reason it's brass is because it won't damage the tip, but it will, all the solder will absorb into the brass, okay? You don't want to use, what you don't want to use, if I can even get it out of here, is a sponge, okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you why. So if I load up my tip with solder, okay, and I've applied a liberal amount of solder, if I just take this guy over here and let me pan my camera over, okay, clean. Clean as a whistle, right? Clean and shiny, all the solder came off. We left a small film, right? But what we didn't do is we didn't damage our tip, okay? When you go, and we're going to apply, again, a liberal amount, and I'm going to come over here. I'm going to tilt my camera over to our, to our sponge. You see those streaks? And it didn't all come off, and we've still got solder left on our tip. And I don't know, let me, let me bring this up here where you guys can see this. Still strings of solder that are there. All that was, I was having to force it off of the tip. And we are thermally shocking, thermally shocking our tip. We don't want to do that. So, all right, let's, let's go back to discussing tinning our tip. So, first thing we're going to talk about when we talk about tinning our tip is we're done for the day. We're done soldering. We're done working. I'm going to turn on my extraction fan because this gets a little bit... Um, gets a little bit smoky. So, when we tin our tip, we're done working for the end of the day. What you want to do is you want to apply, tell you what, let me grab the microscope too, so you can see this with a much better view of what we're actually going to be doing. I think that's the best way to go about this. So, when you tin your tip and you're done working for the day, what you want to do is you want to take your solder and you want to apply to you a good bead down both sides, sorry, trying to, trying to keep it in shot for you, uh, both sides of your tip, okay? Just a good bead, just a good heavy bead of solder, okay? And then you can put it up and shut your iron off and you're done, okay? Shut your iron off. That solder that is on that tip will, in, will insulate it and protect it from any sort of oxidation that may damage the tip of your soldering iron. Okay? Now, and again, when you're done, you just simply take him, you fire him back up once he comes up to temp, and you are ready to go, and your tip is good and clean. And there's no debris on it, and it will last a good long time. See that little silvery shine we've got on him right there? That's what you're looking for, okay? That's what you're looking for. I'm trying to keep him in shot for you. 
It's a little bit of a challenge. Um, that's what you're looking for, okay? Nothing to it. All right? If you are simply replacing a component and you're going to solder the component, and then you're going to move away and come somewhere else and solder another one and come back, and you're doing these in fairly rapid succession, no need, no need to, to, to tin it and wipe it off and tin it. No need to do all that. You know, if you've worked and you've got a little bit on there, you can just simply stick them in there. It, it'll be fine. Here's what I always say. More than five minutes, brush them off. Tin our tip, put a good bead on him, okay, put a good bead on him, like that, okay, and drop him in there, and then if, if more than five minutes, more than whatever, just go ahead and let him sit there, all right, and he's fine, okay. Now, how do we tin a brand new tip, okay, so we're done with this tip for now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and tin him up real good, and then I'm going to switch him over. Okay. Now you can do this hot, or you can wait for it to cool down. If you're going to do this hot, exercise extreme caution. Okay. Don't do what I'm doing, because he's going to be very, very, very warm. Exercise extreme caution. This tip is 395 degrees Celsius. That is really, really, really hot for you. That will really, really, really hurt you. Okay? I'm going to set our tip there. We're going to grab our brand new tip. Exercise extreme caution around this. This is still hot. The tip of this guy, of our soldering iron, not just our tip that we took off, but our soldering iron itself is still, still 395 plus degrees Celsius. Science. The science. Not the, not the centigrade. Science. Okay? Not freedom units. Science. That is about, hit my button, 741 degrees in freedom units. Okay? It's, it's 395 degrees Celsius. All right? So, we've got a brand new tip, right? And we are excited, and we are ready to use this, and all of the good things. So, do you remember I told you about our rosin paste flux tub that is garbage and you shouldn't use? Okay? This is where that comes in. Okay? And I'm going to show you how you do this. Now, there are lots of different ways you can. I'm going to show you the right way. I'm going to show you the best way and the fastest way. I'm going to show you the way that works, and we'll make sure that you can use that tip for a long time. First thing you're going to want to do, and I'm moving my extractor closer because this is going to put out a lot of fumes, and it's that nasty rosin fumes as well. Okay, um, and so the reason you want to tend this uh, is if you go with. Let me set him over here for now. If you go with a brand new tip, and especially these finer pointed ones, okay, uh, these finer pointed guys like this right here, the tip doesn't like to work properly, doesn't like to solder properly, unless it's fully tinned correctly, okay? So here's how you do that. First thing you're going to want to do is let's find out if it's up to temp by just touching it. Okay, we're up to temp, all right? We're going to take this guy, we're going to dunk him in here and just let him sit for a second. You can wiggle him around a little bit. Now what this rosin core flux is doing, all right, is it is etching, acid etching, our tip. Now we're going to take our solder and we're going to just put a healthy dollop, a huge amount of flux, or a huge amount of solder, of leaded solder, okay, on our tip, just to absolutely until it is almost ready to drip off. Okay, and we're just you see how it's still smoking. That's what we want. Okay, that's what we want, and we're just going to keep applying. Okay, we're just going to continue to apply fresh solder, leaded solder, to it. And when he has absolutely cooked, and even if you drip some off in here, that's fine. 
when he is cooked, all right, and I mean just burnt in, okay, like this. Give it a few seconds. Give it a minute or two. No rush here. Okay. Now we're going to take our brass and we're going to clean him back off. Okay. And now we've got a good tinned tip. It has a layer of solder on it and there is nowhere you can touch on that soldering iron that it will not take solder. And that's what you're looking for. If you run if you run your solder across your tip somewhere and it will not if the solder won't melt right there then you have not done a good job tinning. Here's what you do. Okay? Go back in your flux, your paste flux. Again, run them around a little bit. Heat them up. It's all good. Let him sit there until he's about done. Do not breathe these fumes, by the way. Do not breathe these fumes. Rosin core flu or rosin flux is very, very, very bad for you. Uh, it will make you sick. It will tear your throat up. It will hurt your lungs. It will probably, it will probably kill you. Uh, it'll kill you. It'll kill you many times, all at the same time. Okay. And again, we're just applying a healthy, a healthy, huge amount of of solder. Way excessive. If it drops off, we're just going to keep applying. Okay. We're just going to let him sit. Okay. Right now, what's happening is the the acid in the flux is etching, is etching the metal, the 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 copper. Uh, with the with the um, I believe it's copper coated iron tip. It is etching that tip, okay, and it is making it is allowing the solder itself to put a coating all the way around it, and that coating is what protects our tip and gives us long life usage out of it. Tinning a new tip should take you a few minutes. Okay, it is, you don't just dip it in there once. You don't buy pre-tinned tips. Okay, you just don't. I don't care if they say they're pre-tinned, they're not. Alright, and again, there we go. Perfectly tinned, ready to go. just like that just like that right there that is how you tin your soldering iron tip okay so if you ever wanted to know I'm going to put my chisel tip back on because uh, that's what I use the most uh, that's my personal favorite and this type I this type of tip this particular tip here uh, what I a big smear tip is what I call it um, big round looking thing this might be what you like. You might like this kind of tip. I don't. Uh, but if this is what you do your best work with, then this is what you should use. I happen to prefer and do my best work with my chisel tip. Um, I do my best work with it. Uh, I am most comfortable with it, so it's what I use. Uh, I use it 99.9% .9 of the time. Now, if I've got to do some fine soldering, uh, I might switch over to an even finer chisel tip. Some guys don't like the chisel tip at all. I happen to love mine. I think it's the greatest tip ever made. Uh, that's my opinion. You know, you find out which one you like. Get a, get a bunch of them and practice. Uh, use them for different things. Okay? So, that's how we tin a tip. Let's put our jar of paste flux over there and forget it exists because we don't care about it. Okay? Uh, because I hate that stuff. Terrible for you, absolutely terrible. Okay, let's talk about um, let's talk about our desoldering gun. Okay, let's talk about our solder pump. I don't know why I turned that off. I'm probably going to need that. And let's turn him back on. See if I can bring him back over. And a bunch of this stuff I'm going to be doing under a microscope. For you guys, I want you guys to be able to see it. 
Um, so, let's bring our little handy dandy board back over here. And I'll tell you what, here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to take some flux right around in this area. Put a little flux down. Grab our solder. And we're going to solder ourselves a bunch of these. Okay, just soldering up a bunch of these guys. Okay, there we go. And then we're gonna just put a bunch of a bunch of solder down here. Now you see this swirl technique that I'm doing here. Uh, this right here. If you're ever trying to make uh, or or trying to add flux to a large area, you don't want to swipe like this. You don't want to come up and down. You want to do a a circle. Okay. Circles tend to be a lot better. Okay. There we go. Now let's talk about while that's heating up. We've seen solder braid. Let's talk about our desoldering hand pump. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do, here's how this guy works. Here's how, here's how you should do this. You want to come up here to the, to the particular pin that you're wanting to work on. We'll say this guy right here. Uh, this guy right here. We're going to heat him up. You see him go molten. Okay. You, once you see him go molten, you can advance your, your desoldering pump in and hit the button. You want you don't quite you're, you're not trying to force it you're not trying to mash down on it you're just find another one here's a good one right here okay so we're gonna come right here once we see the whole thing go molten come in and hit the button okay and he's gonna pull all that solder out for us now this is very effective and again the effectiveness of these vastly depends on the quality of the tool that you purchased. Okay? And if you guys notice, I don't have to mash. I don't have to push on it. I do have to get it lined up with the right one, though. That's very helpful. Okay? I don't have to force it. Alright? All I have to do is just get, get, get molten. Get molten. Let the solder start getting hot and push the button and it'll pull that it'll pull that old solder right out okay that's what you're looking for now let's talk about our desoldering gun okay so when you're using your desoldering gun first thing you want to do before you even get started on anything else, I don't care if you used it five minutes ago, or last night, two days ago, okay? You want to find your little scrubbers, your little wire scrubbers that, that come with all of them. Make a couple of passes inside and just make sure that there's no solder blocking your path. And what I like to do is I like to take my solder and my desoldering gun and put it down on my silicone mat, pull the trigger, and when you lift up, you'll know if it's sucking properly. Okay? You'll know. All right? So here's how you do this. And I'm going to have to attempt. Okay, that's a good view right there. All right, so let me, I'm going to have to hold this and fix the camera for you guys. Okay. So what you want to do is you want to come in with your desoldering gun. You want to put him at a 90 degree angle over the via. Hold it down. Give it a second. Let it warm up. Pull the trigger. And that will evacuate and remove. Okay. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. Pull the trigger. Okay. Just like that. So 
Just like that. Okay. Super quick and easy. The trick is the 90 degree angle. Now, if you actually have a component in there, how you do this is you come in, you advance your soldering iron over the tip of your component, give your five count, then give a little swivel, okay? And then you're going to swivel while you, just a little swivel while you're suctioning. And that will pull all that solder from around the leg, pull it right on out for you, okay? That is how you use your desoldering gun. But, but, you say, but, I'm going to recover this guy right here. What about, what about our hot air station? How does he work? Glad you asked. So, if you were trying to remove a chip, okay, remove a chip, and I don't have one handy, but what I do have, um, let me use this guy. What is this? This is a uh, thousand UF sixteen. I really want to use that. Uh, we'll use it. True. All right. So we're gonna pretend that this capacitor is a big old IC chip, integrated chip. Attack him in place. Solder him in place. I'm not even trying to do a pretty soldering job. I don't care. I clip my legs off. Okay. So, what you want to do if you're trying to desolder with a heat gun, um, this is going to go better without, well, I might can do it under a microscope if I can find, there's our component, I believe, oh, okay, get your flux, okay, uh, or, in, or in this particular case, your chip quick, right? Let your, let your heat gun come up to temp, not on the board. In other words, don't hold your heat gun on the board to come up to temp. Okay? Don't do that. Let him come up to temp off the board. Okay? And what you're going to do is you're going to come in here and apply this, and you will see... Let me get my tweezers. Let me find my guy. Here we go you will see this go molten, okay? See our solder go molten there? That means that component is ready to be moved, okay? And of course, he's not going to come out for us just because we're, we're not using the proper tool for this. We would use our desoldering gun or our soldering pump our hand pump to remove him. But you get the idea. When it, I don't I don't have a board handy to remove a chip off of that I want to remove a chip off of right now. You but you want to work that board, you want to heat him up with your with your air gun. Um you want to heat him up in such a manner that using a circular motion and I'm going to I'm going to kind of show you that here, right? So if we had a big IC right here in the middle of the chip, a big a big uh, right here in the middle of the board, we we would, what we would want to do is work this in a circular fashion. Okay, watching around, watching our solder, okay, go molten. And once we saw it go molten, this is where having your tweezers come in, you just nudge the chip, okay, you just nudge it, and when you nudge it, okay, you'll see it move. When that, when that chip starts to move, it's ready. It's ready. You can pull it, okay? All right. So... Moving on from there, 
That is really hot. Um, always use extreme caution, guys. Always use extreme caution. Remember that you are working around very hot objects, very dangerous objects. Uh, remember that. Do not forget it. Um, because the second you forget it, uh, the second you're going to get burned and you're going to get hurt. Um, beyond all of that, um, those are the kind of the basics, the intro uh, to, to doing board level rework um, and circuit. I say circuits. We haven't really talked about circuits. We'll do, an, we'll do another video on circuits and how you, um, how you identify the components and capacitors and resistors and uh, diodes and uh, it, transistors, and I'll, we'll do a whole lot, we'll do a series on these uh, as we go. But I think as an intro, um, I think I've given you a lot of information. I hope that you can use it. I hope that it helps you improve uh, in in your soldering and in your work. What I want you to take away from this is uh, this whole entire conversation. All of this is that there is going to be work, guys, that is outside uh, of your ability. Um, there is work right now today that is outside of my ability to do. Um, and there is nothing, nothing in the world wrong with that. What you want to do is you want to practice. Get you a bunch of these breadboards. Get you a bunch of them. And just play with them. Hone your skills in before you go attacking your console or your controller or whatever, your laptop, whatever you're going to be working on. Hone your skills in and practice, right? Um, buy, some, buy some soldering, um, do-it-yourself soldering things, you know, little hearts, little flashing hearts and stuff on Amazon. Buy some of those or eBay. Uh, buy them. Practice. Uh, you know, make things. When I first started off, and it's funny, I, I just happened to grab this board. It was sitting out the other day. Um, this is one of the, and this is this board is years old. Um, but I built me a set of flashing lights, uh, flashing LEDs, just to see if I could, just to learn about it, and to practice my soldering. Um, buy the best equipment you can afford. Now, I can go and buy a hack of soldering iron, but I like my Yehiwa. Okay, um, I, I like them so much. That's that's the brand that I bought for my equipment. I like the way it works. Um, some guys love Hacko. Buy it. If that's what you like, buy it. Um, and I'm going to show you the next video that I'm going to do. I'm going to do another Sega Genesis. And I'm going to do it using um, the cheapest equipment that I can buy. So I'm not even going to use this guy. I'm going to go dig out one of my one of the old garbage plastic ones with the, with the hard plastic nozzle. Uh, and a non-temperature controlled soldering iron. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rework the whole board with it uh, and repair it with just those to show you it can be done. Okay. Now I'm still going to use my good solder and my good flux and my, my isopropyl. I'm still going to use those, right? But as far as the soldering tools, I'm going to use the most basic ones you can get to show you guys that it can be done uh, and, and that it's not, it's not outside of your realm. If you're doing this type of stuff a lot, okay, spend the money and buy good equipment. If you're doing it once, you know, and, and you're replacing a capacitor on your NES or your Genesis, you don't need to spend $300 in, in soldering irons and, you know, desoldering guns. And you don't, need, you don't need to spend a fortune getting all of the tools Necessary. You don't need to buy a, a, three, a, a you know $150 microscope. You don't need that. A magnifying glass will do the job for you, and it'll do it really well. You know. Um, but what I want to show you guys is that it can be done, but there are proper techniques. Uh, and I guess that's where I want to end this video, guys. Is practice. Practice makes perfect. Get in there. Don't be afraid. Buy you some breadboards, like I said, some of these guys. Buy you a handful of resistors and capacitors and LEDs and make you a light, right? Make you just buy you some LEDs and make you a light, okay? Get online and find you some simple circuits and buy the components and just make you some practice. And the more you practice, the better you'll get. And before you know it, 
that really hard job that you thought you couldn't pull off, you'll be doing with ease. And it doesn't take a whole lot of effort once you have the skills and you've practiced up. Okay? Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. We're going to do more videos like this over time. Um, I don't know how, how often I'm going to do these. Uh, I may do them once a week or once a month. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but uh, we're going to do more videos like this. I, I want to be able to teach you guys uh, about this stuff. I want you to learn with me. Uh, I want you to grow. I want you to get better. And, and if I can help you do that, um, that would mean a lot to me. And hopefully, you know, it will mean something to you too. So at any rate, uh, thanks for watching, guys. If you like this video, hit that like button, subscribe, uh, and hit that bell icon for more videos like this one. We'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks.